Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have the unenviable position of being between you and lunch. So I, I will try to make this fast and efficient. And I know you've been through some very exciting talks in the, in the morning. And you certainly don't want to listen to someone as mundane and boring as myself after the exciting luminaries who have spoken about some very exciting talks. In some ways, my task is difficult considering there's lunch waiting for you. And in some ways, my task is much easier because we just had some very, very strong brands talking to you over the last few couple of hours. And of course, um, the speakers before me spoke about perhaps one of the biggest and the most, most exciting brand that the world has seen in terms of the nation brand, which is the UAE, which is, which is Dubai, and everything that embodies us. But before I carry on and speak about branding, and I have to say, with a fair bit of trepidation, you know, when I was asked to come and speak to people in the accounting profession about branding, I was, I was really scratching my head and I said, how am I going to do that to a bunch of accountants? How am I going to do it to a bunch of auditors? And, and I said, what the hell, at best, they can go ahead and qualify everything that I say. So, so go ahead. The other big advantage I have, I'm an ardent admirer of everything that the financial community and the auditing and the accounting standards committee of the profession does because I'm a big user of your services. But I did say, Maybe I'll never be in conformance with the international reporting standards of what I'm going to say today. But again, what the hell? I can afford to do that and then we'll try to tell you a little bit of what branding means to me, having created uh, a brand after working in a highly successful global brand for much of my life. Uh, I decided that I would like to create a brand that would make a difference. And then, perhaps I will take a few minutes to try and relate this to what it should mean for the accounting profession. For all of you, because you perhaps collectively represent one of the biggest brands in the world too. That's the ace, that's Charter Accountants. <laughs> what really is a brand? Simply put, you know, you can give it all kinds of fancy definitions, but simply put, if you go back to the Wild West, it was simply the clamping of a hot, wrought iron rod on the behind of cattle and livestock. And every time somebody got that, you knew exactly whose cattle it was, you knew whose livestock it was. And if you look deeper in, you would know the quality of the livestock. So simply put, that's what a brand is. At least for a certain communication of values, it tells you certain things about you. Step back and see how we sit back and look at the impressions we create on people when we meet them the first time. The first time we meet people, we create a first impression. We decide how they are. Do we want to talk to them? Do we want to know them? Once we feel comfortable with what I see, what you see, you decide to go ahead and make the first interaction or the first adoption. That's like the first trial. That's like the first purchase you make. And once you do that, what happens next? If your experience of the first adoption of the interaction of the first purchase is positive, you go ahead and try it again. And if the second time is good, and the third time is good, and the fourth time is good, you say, wow, this is consistent. This is unique. This is positive. It becomes a brand. So in effect, everything that you talk about in terms of how we interact with each other can be extended on to objects, to services, to products, to people, to nations, to corporates, to governments. And that's what it is all about. So what really are the rules of branding? I could think of 10. Anything that's unique and differentiated, anything that's consistently positive, anything that's trustworthy, anything that's credible and easy to understand. Imagine having something that you cannot understand. But it's easy to understand the red hot symbol that goes behind capital, right? It's got to be relevant. If it doesn't fulfill your need, if it doesn't do something for what you want, it's not going to really be meaningful as a brand. The world is changing, so it's very important for a brand to be creative and innovative. Please do remember these rules because I will play this back to the big brand that I'm addressing today. It's got to be easy to access. Imagine you're salivating for something, you want to get it, but you don't know how to get it. It must be talent based. We live in an age of machines, we live in an age of computers and data. We sometimes assume that human beings can be replaced. I strongly believe that's not possible. Machines can be very efficient. Machines can be highly effective. But machines will never substitute for emotional intelligence. And that is so important in this world. A brand must be evolving because the world is changing. And finally, the brand must be ethical and caring. And in some ways, we live in Dubai. It represents all of those. It welcomes us as foreigners in the country and allows us to stay with a very positive reception. Building a brand is important because once you build a brand, you're able to harness its 
value and strength and leverage business, get repeat purchase, get people to buy you, buy your products, create wealth because you create pricing power, repeatability, and a lot of value, which keeps coming back and gets reflected in the balance sheets and the p &L that you uh, create. So the brand is enormous. So while it is very difficult to create, no different from the pain that the cattle feels when, you, when the red hot iron is put at the backside of, its, uh, of the stock, it's equally painful for a marketeer to be able to build a brand. Because the task of building a brand requires a lot of work, a lot of focus, a lot of dedication, and a fair bit of consistency in what you do. But once it is built, it gives you a lot of benefits. It makes things easier. It allows you to sell things again and again. It allows you to be instantly recognized and communicate a brand value. It engenders pull. So when you think of chartered accountants, you know you can trust them. It self-selects a better target segment. It exactly gets you the target segment you want. It allows for value-based pricing. So it gives you pricing power. It allows for repeat sales. It gives you that loyalty. It erects business entry barriers, and it also creates strong affinities. And eventually, it keeps the customer ahead because a good brand will keep evolving and provide people with changes that they're looking for. How do you build a brand? I think the three foundations, the three pillars of the foundation that are very important. Create a vision, create stature, and eventually make sure that you build an enabling culture. A vision must define what you're really trying to achieve, and a vision should often be much bigger than what you will ever achieve. Only then will you get people engaged. It's very important to have, when you talk about stature, certain attributes that people are going to be looking at, perceive you on, and eventually get attracted by. And lastly, when I talk about an enabling culture, it must have a personality that the target audience looks at. Now these are highly, you know, very marketing-oriented terms, but I, I have to say that if you don't talk to the right audience, and if you don't know who you're talking to, there is no way that you can create a brand and deliver some of the consistency that you're talking about. So while it is, I, I'm going to now go out and talk a bit about my own experiences of having set up Dunya. Not talk about Dunya, but talk about how painful it can be to build a new brand. When you are a new creator, an entrepreneur, or a new person who's setting out to do something different, it's extremely difficult to set up a brand. It's very scary because you have limited resources. You, have, you don't know what will work and what won't work. You have existing competitors who set up very strong competition barriers against you, and you don't know how they will react. And eventually, you really don't know which initiative works and which doesn't. But what the hell? I say this again and again, because that's the attitude you have to have when you build a brand. I don't say it because I want to use language that may not be appropriate for a session of this nature. But it's important to have that attitude when you build a brand when you have defined your vision, you've created your stature, and have established an enabling culture to be consistent to your course, irrespective of the resources you have. Because it is not what you make or what you do that makes a difference. It's a question of how you do it that is being watched by everyone. In this era of mobility, telecommunication, data, social media, and cloud, more and more people are watching you. So no longer will hyperbole work. No longer will rhetoric work. No longer can you come in front of people and say things about your brand and expect people to believe it. Because people have access to multiple views. As, uh, as I think Rajdeep said earlier in the session, while you're talking, there could be people tweeting to each, towards each other. There could be people messaging and people completely going out of the way and deciding what the attitude and perception is building up in this room as I speak about me. So there is no amount of uh, delivery excellence that will define what you do if you don't keep the attention of people going and the relevance of what you're saying relevant to them. Eventually, we must remember that any brand has a huge amount of intangible assets. It's a little scary for me to talk about assets in the presence of so many people from the accounting profession. But, as I said, I have the luxury uh, of being able to speak for a few minutes, so I should take the liberty at the risk of getting beaten up. But eventually, those are the elements that eventually create the financial results, the, the financial reporting that each of you do. And if those elements are not right, they will never get handled well. And we, which is why we need to understand what those intangible assets are. The employees of the company, the customer base of the company, the repeatability of the business models, the ethics in which the models work, 
the sustainability of the business proposition and the way you do business and the business practice you follow, where do you see any of these items in the financial report of the company? But in some ways, as a person who has used financial services, been in financial services, worked in multiple countries, and has created brands multiple times, number of times, I can tell you those are the elements that eventually lead to what we, or I, would like to call the derived numbers that eventually people look at. At this point of time, I'd like to speak about the yin and yang of, bank, of branding. You know yin and yang, together they make a whole. So even in branding, it's very important that as you go out and set a brand, you decide that there are some elements that you execute well, and some elements that you execute after thinking a whole lot. If you go ahead and take an indefinite amount of time and constantly watch and wait and think and never act, you will not be able to create a brand which is of the right value because markets are evolving, thoughts are changing, communications are happening. And so a simple rule is that the cost of creating, distributing, and failing is low. Go ahead and take that action fast. There's nothing better, as Jack Ma of Alibaba says, there's nothing better than making mistakes early. Because once you make a mistake, you learn pretty early on what not to do. When you take small steps and make mistakes, you pretty well learn if the thing works, what you must reinforce. If it doesn't work, what you must not do again. But at the same time, there are far critical elements that are very, very important to think before you change and do. So the other end of the yin and yang is, do not go ahead and take action on things where the impact can be catastrophic. And I think a good case in point, which is highly topical today, is that of Maggie Noble's in the country. One of the most successful products which has gone across generations and has occupied the mind share of people and children of each of us as we grew up, and one of the fastest growing revenue areas of Nestle in India has gone ahead and attacked the company and set it back in just a few days. So decades and decades of brand building has been destroyed for a simple reason that the tenth element of my rule was ignored, ethics. They didn't stop then. Just a couple of days back, each of you may have read, Unilever in India withdrew nor noodles. Not that they have been impacted by any of the same claim, but the category is at risk. So when you're Unilever, you don't want to take a chance with something that critical and not test your product before continuing to risk the, uh, the possibility of someone going out and attacking their own product. So look at the disservice of you. Uh, unscrupulous managers or less, or less careful managers have done, not only to the stakeholders, the users, the children, the parents and everyone else who consumes it, but the millions of employees around the world, the shareholders who have been impacted by the Nestle value, and more importantly, now, every country in the world is going out and looking at these noodles, because it's a big category and shipping on them. Look at what can happen. These are some not so positive recent examples. On the other side, if you look at doing things and find that if you do not keep evolving and do not keep changing with times, as BlackBerry was, a great company that helped you recognize the need for instant messaging, for remote messaging, but did not go out and evolve it itself, got lost in its own success, and did not realize that as the process of convergent disruption was taking place, internet, technology, cloud, data, was all building up, they did not transform themselves in time and left a wide open space for Apple. And Apple created a simple product, credible, and they constantly come out with a certain amount of predictability and have created success one after the other and have done wonders. Nokia is another case in point. So it's very important for a brand to reinvent itself. Please do not sit down on your success, whether you're an individual, whether you're an association, whether you're a brand. You constantly question yourself, read. Don't read to follow. Listen to views, not because you must be indoctrinated into believing what they say is right, or what I say is right, or what each of you say is right. It's important for us as individuals to use our emotional and intellectual capabilities to take in different viewpoints and digest it and build our own and act against it. We are all sensible people and nature has all given us, has given us a very, very sensible ability to be able to digest information and act on it. And that's the principal reason why the normal curve exists, where 99% of the people in the world are still fundamentally good. So reinventing your core is very important for a business, for a profession, for a government, for a corporation. It revitalizes the team. It brings in new talent. It brings in new ideas. It allows for customer satisfaction and loyalty. It enhances the limited size of any natural market. 
if you do not continue to create yourself or recreate yourself, iPhone 6 created a new category. iPod created a new category. You have to constantly create me to help people understand cloud today is creating a new category. E-commerce is creating a new category. Will it hit physical brick and mortar stores? The answer is no. Will it create new jobs? The answer is yes. Because it will create a whole new way of creating efficiency from the factory gate to the consumer, but also create a whole new line in logistics and data and technology and everything else that goes into delivery. It's just a different set of business skills that comes in and a new set of skills that are going to become important in the world. So stay ahead with trends. So that's really brand building about you. And now I'm getting into the dangerous part, apart from keeping you from lunch, I'm going to dare to talk about the brand that I have the pleasure of and the honor of talking to. I think one of, the, of course, apart from the fact that the big brand here is a large representation of Indians, which is a big brand by itself as a country, NRIs, which is a subset itself of a highly consistent and successful brand, but more importantly, of chartered accountants, people from the auditing and accounting profession, which perhaps is the biggest brand that one thinks of when it comes to reporting financial standards. The CPA profession is built, and please, as I said, I, I stand qualified. I'm not a chartered accountant, so if I say anything which is incorrect, please accept it as, as a perception and reality that comes across. The CPA profession is built on the principles of integrity. The CPA profession is identified as a body of people who are known to be from a group who are all independent business advisors. People who are supposed to be specialists in looking at financial results and handle standards of reporting and accounting in a manner such that people across the world can look at them in a common, consistent fashion and make decisions. How critical is that? That's a unique, differentiated, consistent, positive definition of a brand. How important is it? Major decisions in the world by governments, multilateral institutions, corporations, business executives get taken by the outcome that each of you create. Look at the kind of influence each of you wield. Look at the collective power of this brand. And what, does, what comes after, what comes with this level of brand strength? A huge amount of responsibility and accountability. And this is where it is very important for the CPA profession as a brand to look at itself and say, are we living up to the brand and are we living up to the principles of the brand as much as we need? Not because you're not, but every brand must look at it. Every brand must reinvent itself. Every brand must see the evolution and check whether it is doing so. The other thing is, each of you as members of a single institute are upholders of the brand value and the core brand and essence of what the brand connotes. Are each and every member, is each and every member of this institute who practices following the same principles. Because remember, one little incident can destroy the value of the brand that has been built painstakingly by multiple members over the years, over the decades. And I say this because that's the responsibility any brand custodian must have. As, as members of the fraternity that create the brand, that uphold the brand, one should respect the core essence, but one should also reinvent it. So here's a contentious question that I throw before each of you. When we're talking about brand and brand value, one of the things that's always baffled me as a person from outside the profession but a user of these services is why does the accounting firms or why do the accounting professionals recognize brand value which does so much to create wealth, create repeatability, create intangible assets in any company which results in good res in financial results, record the core brand value at historical costs. Think about it. I know we've been told that over the years, but if that is the way brand value is going to be recognized, it only reflects the costs that have been incurred by an institution in creating the brand. But it has not ever taken into effect what goes into building a brand. And once the brand is built, and once those incurred expenses start giving the results that they require, that are required to create repeatability, how do you reflect that in the balance sheet? I asked this to a few people. I didn't ever have the luxury of asking so many professionals together, so I thought I should place it. My own CFO often challenges me on this. My audit firms talk about it, but I always challenge them on this question. And then the obvious answer is, well, whenever a realization takes place and you do a sale or an IPO or whatever you do, the value is reflected in the value of the sale price. And I said, uh-huh, 
Isn't that a little strange? While you may reflect that in the poor goodwill that you will reflect in the books of the buyer, what happens to the seller? Isn't it too late to realize that you were sitting on some very good value? So isn't the profession meant to give people a leading indicator of what the health of a business and the core brand values are? Do we have to go through a process of sale to figure out what the core values are? Are two institutions which earn the same amount of money in the same business, but through two very different means creating the same amount of value? Currently, not so. In the current international reporting standards, whether it's IFRS, IASB, or international accounting standards, or any country's accounting standards, the entire focus is on following a set of rules without really thinking through how the world has changed. And that, to me, is a true pity. I think it's high time. Each of you, the collective body, and many of those who are not here today, sit back and question. The world has changed. The business priorities have changed. What was politically correct in the past is no longer politically correct. What was right to do in the past is no longer right to do. What the stakeholders value as good behavior and led to high multiples when it created businesses has changed over the years. Ethics, integrity, repeatability is very, very important. So it's a point to ponder. The second thing is, since you have this big responsibility, and I know Richard is gradually walking towards me, so I will make it very, very fast before he throws me out of here. But I think it's very important to know also that each of you have a tremendous amount of influence like any good brand does. If you are recording financial results and reporting standards in certain ways, based on which multilaterals, governments, business executives are making decisions, it is very important that in the presence of data, in the presence of many more scorecards, in the presence of all kinds of algorithms, the traditional historical concept be extended and the reporting standards be extended in a manner such that the core intangible assets of a business to differentiate between two businesses with similar business models but practiced in very different ways with similar results can be differentiated upon. The moment you do that, you be, you're able to create a few things. Firstly, things are changing rapidly. Standards of behavior are changing. Expectations are changing. But more importantly, we are in a dynamic world. The CPA profession can today drive good, drive change, drive predictability and sustainability which the world needs. We went through a crisis in 2008 in the world. Number of jobs that were destroyed. Wealth has been created. But look at the disparities in the world. We all talk about crime. We talk about filth. We talk about disparities. We talk about discrimination. But in some ways, isn't this not coming because of the lack of certain issues which are not being rewarded in the world? What are society's most uh, challenging and most uh, pressing uh, problems? Are these being suitably addressed? The answer is no. But who can significantly impact it? You can. Today, society's important challenges are employment, education, environment, health, social inclusion, financial inclusion, gender inclusion, sustainability, so that the world that we leave behind us is richer for the people who come after us, for our children, for people who have a future ahead. We cannot be seen as guzzlers and leave a highly that disparate world, which was more disparate than what it was when we entered it. We would be seen as being terribly self selfish if we did that. And so, at this point of time, I appeal to all of you, as you uphold one of the most noble professions, built on the standards of quality, integrity, principles and objectivity, to sit back and look how you can reward executives like us out in the real world who also understand the important business executive role and responsibility of driving sustainability. But it can only be done if the reporting, qualifying, and rewarding standards are suitably ordered to be able to say, sometimes in life it is good to sacrifice short-term return to build long-term value. And there is nothing today in the reporting standards that can be able to make that difference. So look at the power of the brand. I was asked to speak about the power of branding when Raju spoke to me. And I said, how can I tell a bunch of accountants what branding is? And here is what I'm saying. You yourself sit in one of the most powerful brands in the world, which can make governments change, governments change their actions, companies change their actions, executives change their actions, professionals change their actions, multilateral change, change their actions. So look at enhancing valuations. You can't make a sudden change, but you can look at enhancing it. Every brand must evolve itself. The important principle which I would like to leave with you, ladies and gentlemen, is we all need to learn how we can do good while we do good business.
The objective is not just to do good business. And doing good business is not just always making money. The objective of a good business that makes, that does good and builds money sensibly so that it is repeatable, it is ethical, it makes the disparities in the world come down, it reduces crime, it improves health, it makes our living conditions do better, it creates inclusion, then each of you can very proudly uphold and create the brand even stronger. For everything that those who gave it to you as a legacy have created, you will pass on as a legacy and help drive what the world really needs, value creation, but most importantly, sustainability. Thank you so much.